Hi there, uh, my name is Jamie Methurst and I'm reader in film, television and media at Aberystwyth University. And what I'd like to do in, in this session is kind of preparatory really for the discussion that we're going to have on the 18th of January is just to outline some ideas about documentary, documentary form. Um, I've called this, this session documentary the creative treatment of actuality question mark um, and that's certainly part of the uh, part of the question I'd like to ask and part of the discussion that, that we can have um, I'd also like to, to think about uh, Bill Nichols documentary for, uh, modes as well um, those six categories that are helpful to us in analyzing and thinking about documentary in a critical way and we can pick up on these ideas then uh, in the discussion on the 18th so let's just start with a, a bit about the nature of documentary um, it's problematic. Well, that's a good start, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I always start with a with a somewhat what negative thing. Um, and when I say problematic, it's 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 a good thing in a way because I you know, I think it just lets us get to grips and discuss and debate what documentary is. There are certain assumptions around documentary, um, and we can we can we can probably kick off with some of these when we when we have the discussion on the on the eighteenth. Um, you know, there's an assumption that the events films must generally be unstaged. Although we know that's a little bit problematic too. Uh, we generally accept that these are, are non-fiction films and non-fiction uh, television programmes, factual television. Um, and we assume, or there is an assumption, that they are an objective record of the events that they are recording. Hmm. What we do know, of course, is that the, the raw footage, or the, the actuality, the things that are happening, are in fact shaped and ordered into a form that is generally sequential and presentable by the documentary filmmaker. Not all documentary will sort of uh, will, will will come into this definition, I guess, but you know, quite a few do, and that is part of the problematic issue, I think. Um, and that's what's great about documentary. That's why I love documentary film and documentary television. But let's go back to this idea of, of actuality for a second, um, when we think about definitions of documentary. Now this one, uh, definition, this definition by John Grierson, who's considered you know, to be perhaps the father of, of a British documentary, uh, led the documentary film movement uh, in, in the 1930s. Um, when he directed one film himself, Drifters, from, from 1929, now I won't make you watch Drifters, um, it's about the uh, the herring fishing industry. It's a great film, and I've shown it uh, several times to my my students. Uh, last showed it to our postgraduate students in documentary as well, and that they enjoyed it. But it's it's not an easy watch. <laughs> uh, maybe some other time. But John Grierson, um, a, a, an important and influential figure in in the British documentary movement defined documentary as the creative treatment of actuality and in some ways that's a great definition um, and in other ways it is a bit vacuous and doesn't really mean much I've got my cup of coffee here as well but excuse me the creative treatment of actuality now what I want to do uh, in as I think it's the second point in the discussion on the 18th is just to think what you understand by the creative treatment of actuality this this great definition of documentary which is both meaningful and, and meaningless at the same time um, and it's a it's a great starting point actually for any discussion of documentary and um, Grierson um, had three points that, that he, he I suppose uh, used to 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 qualify um, this uh, definition, the creative treatment of actuality. He said that a documentary must utilize cinema's capacity for getting around and making use of camera technology by recording material from the social world, from, from out there in real life. The documentary must make use of the original or native actor and the original or native scene uh, because they are better guides to a screen interpretation of the modern world. So I'm not having much I suppose um, much time for for fiction for uh, those films that used uh, actors you know, playing parts, the original scene, the original backdrop, the original location, the original actor were a better guide uh, in terms of interpreting the modern world uh, in uh, on the screen. Now it's interesting when when, when Grierson writes this. I mean, the, the world is changing in the 1930s um, uh, quite considerably. The, you know, coming out of, of, of the Second World, uh, sorry, the First World War uh, in, the, in the 1920s and the period leading up, the changes that took place uh, socially, politically, economically in the 30s, um, and, and Grierson 
seeing documentary as a way of explaining those changes to an audience. Uh, he went over to the United States in, in their 20s and um, uh, came under the um, uh, influence or, or met with um, Walter Lippmann, who was um, uh, a great one of the, the great thinkers in, in the States at the time. And Grayson almost saw cinema, I think he called it, the cinema was a kind of pulpit for explaining the changes in the modern world to people. And documentary was a perfect form, he thought, of doing, uh, of doing that. Documentary, thirdly, said, makes use of the particular effect that spontaneous events have when captured on camera and presented on screen. It's more, it's finer, it's more real, he said, more philosophically superior than that mediated material, so that scripted material, that material that, that is um, uh, created uh, perhaps by a, by a writer or a director. Now, it's kind of a yes, but <laughs> with all these definitions. And again, we're back to that idea of, of what a, a concrete definition of documentary actually is. Um, another definition, uh, Marcel uh, Offel, who is um, a French-German documentary maker. Documentaries are not my favourite kind of movie watching. The fact is I don't trust the little beep. I don't trust the nature of those who are thinking they're superior to fiction films. I don't trust their claim to have cornered the market on truth. That's an interesting one, isn't it? That notion of truth in documentary and reality in documentary. I don't trust their inordinately high and entirely undeserved status of bourgeois respectability. Oh, there's a lot in that definition. Maybe we could we could, we could spend some time unpacking this one as well in our discussion. Um, that sense that somehow documentary is superior to fiction film because it deals with truth and reality and fact. Oh, do they actually do that? Bill Nichols, um, who we'll come on to in a bit more detail in a second, uh, argues that, that all films document something. Every film, he argues, is a documentary. Even though it's whimsical of fictions, gives evidence of the culture that produced it. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting point. You know, the, the, the context of the cultural uh, values at the time are reflected in a particular film, and therefore it is documented in that way. It reproduces the likeness of the people who perform within it. In fact, we could say there are two kinds of film. Documentary is a wish fulfillment, perhaps these you know, the, the kinds of films, fiction type films that he's referring to here. And secondly, documentaries of social representation, that each type tells a story, but the stories or narratives are of a different sort. Again, we might pick up on some of these points uh, in the discussion. Mind, we only have three quarters of an hour to discuss, but uh, so there's a lot to pack in that. But have a think about these definitions between uh, watching this uh, presentation and, and, and the discussion, because there's a lot that we could go after, I think. Now, sticking with Bill Nichols, um, Nichols uh, came up with various, or six actually, modes of representation uh, which help us provide a framework um, to analyse and think about documentary film. Now, I suppose at this point you say other modes are available and different theorists, different uh, documentary uh, scholars take different approaches, but Bill Nichols uh, are generally accepted to be extremely useful to provide that, that foundation, I suppose, of documentary film uh, and television studies. They also provide, it's interesting, we'll see in a second, the kind of chronology of documentary development from the early years in, uh, of, of the 1920s, you know, filmmakers uh, like Robert Flaherty, for example, um, uh, and, uh, I don't know if, if any of you are familiar with Nanook of the North, I suppose that, that classic foundational documentary. Um, and that's useful when, when we look now at the, the modes of representation, how they reflect developments over time. Now, some would say the developments are due to uh, technology, technological developments. Um, uh, others would say it's more to do with social or cultural uh, changes over time. Um, it's probably a bit of both. And not all films will, of course, sit neatly into the modes that Nichols um, uh, has outlined here so there will be some films who perhaps sit between two modes or don't fit into any of the kind of modes of, of representation that Nichols discusses. And the, the six modes uh, as outlined here are poetic, expository, observational, participatory, reflexive and performative and we'll just go through briefly looking some of the characteristics um, one by one in a second. But, but you know they, they also follow that, that, that chronology of you know the, the poetic and the expository documentaries in the 1920s emerging as I said from, from, from filmmakers uh, like, like Larry Grierson uh, and, and Flaherty and then in, in Britain think about Humphrey Jennings, some of the wartime documentaries. Moving on into the observational participatory 
documentaries which emerge in the 60s, um, you know, form part of the direct cinema, cinema verite, the, the cinema of truth movement. Um, the camera equipment becomes lighter, sync sound becomes possible. It's able to get the camera into places, into locations that they couldn't get into before. And so, for example, in the 1950s, late 50s, you have um, uh, some wonderful films from the, the British free cinema movement, getting into youth clubs in Lambeth at the time, getting into to jazz clubs, Mama... Uh, um, Mama don't allow you know, a film is a film about about jazz club. These somewhat seedy clubs, perhaps um, are, you know, get that hadn't been seen on screen before, or young voices being seen on screen before, because cameras and uh, you know, they, they were lighter. They, they they weren't these huge things on tripods. They were they were handheld. You could get into these places and show things on screen that, that hadn't been shown previously. And then more reflexive performative documentaries emerge from the nineteen. 80s onwards and of course as we go through as well you know we, we know that, that we're not just talking film here but we're talking you know, documentary on television and television has a key role to play in the development of documentary but perhaps that's another session for another time so let's just briefly go through some of these modes and we can i say we can pick up on these uh, and look at some some clips um uh, in the discussion in January. So the poetic mode for some of the chief characteristics is reassembling a fragment of the world parts of the world in a very poetic way there are there are temporal rhythms and spatial juxtapositions in some of these films. Um, they offer perhaps an alternative forms of knowledge. They are they're, they're, they're part of, I suppose, a modernist movement. Certainly in the in in, in the twenties um, and, and thirties and through actually to the to the forties, um, the that poetic mode of documentary is important. Thinking particularly in, in terms of um, somebody again like Humphrey Jennings, the wartime documentarist. A lot of his his films are created within this poetic mode of documentary. They, when I say deficiencies, perhaps that's too strong a word. Perhaps I should have said, you know, um, issues with. They tend to be, uh, they tend to lack specificity. They tend sometimes to be too abstract, and, and not to focus in, on a particular uh, a point. But we can we can pick up on some of these uh, issues again in the discussion. Now, the expository documentary. Some of the characteristics here. This is probably the form of documentary, certainly, which made the transition to television. Um, and, 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 and actually, there's a link here between expository documentaries and um, current affairs type documentary programs that we see on television from the, 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 the late 50s, 60s onwards. Uh, these directly address, issue, address issues. There is rhetoric, there is argument here, there's a direct address um, uh, of the viewer, you know, from, from, a, from a voice of God narration, this, this, this voice of the uh, sorry, this bodiless voice that, that talks to us. Um, the images, it's been argued in, in, in these kind of documentaries, are actually there only to support the, the, the narrative, support the voiceover, support the, you know, what is being said. There's a common sense view of the world as well. But they are often accused of or criticised for being overly didactic, um, uh, almost being talked down to. They can be used as propaganda. They are patronizing at times as well and, and and very often we'll deal in 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 the general rather than the specific or the or the particular i just want to show you um, a, a clip here from um uh, a documentary uh, that was produced by by grierson uh, from 1935 housing problems a great deal these days is written about the slums this film is going to introduce you to some of the people really concerned. First, Councillor Lauder, chairman of the Stepney Housing Committee, will tell you something of the problem of slum clearance. The problem of the slum faces us because in the early days, rows upon rows of ugly, badly designed houses were hastily put up to provide accommodation for the ever-increasing army of workers which poured in from the country to the towns. Here are some pictures of typical slum architecture. This roof is sagging because the rafters have decayed. No amount of new tiles will put it right. When these houses were erected, anyone could build a factory right outside your front door. Many of the houses are so old that they have to be shored up to prevent them falling down altogether. Sometimes the mortar falls away from the brick and the walls bulge out. Here are examples of sheer neglect. These walls probably haven't been attended to since before the war, and the woodwork has gone unpainted for generations. Many houses have not got water laid on, 
people have to manage as well as they can with a tap in the yard and sometimes at the end of the street. Few houses have provision for the drying of washing and the clean clothes have to be hung up in the narrowest of backyards. When it's wet, the clothes have to be dried in the passage. Here's a typical interior of a decayed house. And here, the lath and plaster have given away altogether. This lavatory and sink has to do for four families. And now for the people who have to live in the slums. Here is Mr. Norwood. These two rooms which I am in now, I have to pay ten shillings a week for, and I haven't a room to swing a cat round. I've also got five other neighbours alongside of me with the same predicament as I'm in myself. And I'm not only overrun by bugs, I've got mice and rats. Okay, well, on that subject of mice and rats, perhaps we'll, we'll head back to the slide. Um, it's, it's a wonderful documentary, I, you know, you, some of you may have seen clips of it before, um, but you know, it's. It, that, that slightly patronising tone, to, or at least to our ears today, you know, if you, we'll talk to some people who have to live in these kind of places. You know, is this a, a very, um, I suppose, you know, middle class looking in from the outside kind of documentary? Again, it's, it's, it's a wonderful historical document. Again, if there's time, we'll come back to that perhaps uh, in the session in uh, January. Okay, moving on to the observational type documentary, which is used um, commentary and, and reenactment. The idea here is that they, it observes things as they happen. It's life as lived, not life as narrativized. Um, uh, so uh, that's a, an idea, again, of, of Bill Nichols. Um, there's no obvious interference with the subjects of the film. Uh, the camera is handheld. There are generally long takes. And so it's realistic in terms of temporality, in terms of the, the, the time it, feel, it feels real. There are issues here around ethics and voyeurism and consent of the subject makers. And you know, there's this idea, and of course, this, this was the argument of the direct cinema in the 60s, um, uh, Don Pennebaker and others uh, like him, who, who argued that you know the, the camera could just record life as it really is. But of course, for every, you know, you're pointing the camera here, well, what's going on there isn't being recorded. Plus, that idea of a camera uh, changing events. I mean, you know, if, if you think of yourselves in, in a classroom and a camera comes in, perhaps you're sitting there like this, listening to the teacher, well, I'm sure it's, it's very interesting, but, you know, a film crew comes in and perhaps you sit up like this, perhaps you would, you know, pay attention because you're aware that you're being filmed. I remember uh, years ago in, in, in the university I had a class, um, there was a, it was a documentary uh, following a student through uh, university life, and the student happened to be in one of my, uh, one of my classes, uh, and that the day that they came into film, the students were smart, they were sitting up nicely like this, I even wore a shirt and tie, which I never do, um, and you know, we behaved differently because the camera was there, and yet to all intents and purposes, the viewer at home would think that this was real life being recorded. Problematic. Documentary is problematic. Just remember that documentary is problematic. Participatory documentaries, and this is where the filmmaker will interact or will interview subjects. Again, in that engagement, there's an active engagement here um, between filmmaker and subject. Um, it, it gets under the surface of events as well, but maybe it's too obtrusive. You know, maybe maybe the interviews are coercive. Maybe um, you know what is what is going what is what is objective uh, in a participatory documentary what i suggest I'm, I'm sort of going through these providing foundations it's worth following up i'm sure if you haven't done so already worth following up in more detail perhaps um uh, some of these uh, ideas of, of bill nichols reflexive documentaries well this is these documentaries interestingly that question documentary form they defamiliarize i think the 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 audience certainly it it makes us question how how we we think about representation it questions the constructedness of of what's real um a great one you may have come across a man with a movie camera uh, from uh, 1929 the uh, soviet filmmaker ziga vertov which uh, the film just throws you all the time because one minute you're watching the film and the next minute you're watching that film being edited and you're watching people watching the film um you know it can 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 sometimes be a little bit abstract and sometimes actually lose sight of what it's trying to do and and these films about films about films can throw the audience um uh, at certain time. it's great to be defamiliarized and thrown about a little bit but sometimes these these documentary films just go a little too far and then performative documentaries which again um are, are subjective raising questions about knowledge it can position us and i suppose 
um, yeah, thinking about the, 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 as I say, the, the these documentary forms are sort of exclusive, but there's overlap at times. Um, but you can be positioned as an audience to empathise with or to really react against um, uh, the subject matter in, in a film. They have been criticised for being overly excessive um, in terms of the use of style. That that you know the the the, the loss of that emphasis on objectivity leads them to being just mere avant-garde experimental uh, film um so there are issues i think around around performative documentaries now um finally are we in a post-documentary era you know some claim the documentary as a category is over that its claim on the real is relinquished is gone you know that it's it's, it's borrowed from other types of film and television it's a it's a hybrid kind of form uh, at the moment. You, know, you think um, uh, yeah, particularly of, of I don't know, uh, docu-soaps, for example, um, which borrow from soap and, and documentary. You know, that, that documentary l look as well, that, that idea that if you, if you had that handheld shaky camera kind of feel to it, that it was real, that it guaranteed truth. Well, uh, you know, is that the case? Um, anymore has it lost its status going back to the Marcelo Fulce um, quote perhaps you know, as that guarantor of truth as having some kind of elevated status in the film and television world and then of course we've got the impact of digital technology has, has digital technology impacted on on documentary in terms of what it can do or as I would argue that the actual the actual nature of documentary that idea of essentially you know, telling a story in in a way that is relatable to one that an audience can engage with that that's still at the heart of documentary it doesn't matter how you go about creating it that that is the heart of the documentary um, mission i suppose okay so preparing for the discussion in in january um what i'd like you to do is to to think about that phrase creative treatment of actuality what does it mean to you um, come along to the session and we'll get some clips up. Um, we'll analyze them against Nichols' documentary modes. We'll think about you know, whether those modes of representation are useful in terms of thinking about documentary. And then have a think about this one. Do you think that the advent of digital technology has had an impact on documentary form in terms of what documentary can do, how it's put together? Well, maybe the way it's put together, maybe, maybe the way it's produced has, has changed thanks to digital technology. But what about the actual, the heart of documentary? what documentary is all about has that really uh, changed in any way okay thank you very much indeed um and uh i hope you've enjoyed the session i will see you in january on the 18th of january all the best <laughs>